From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Do you believe the bulk collection of metadata for domestic telephone calls or emails is appropriate, even when the majority of individuals with whom the calls or emails are associated are law-abiding Americans? I do know as a general matter that the collection of metadata and analysis of metadata is a valuable tool in counterterrorism. At his confirmation hearing, FBI Director nominee James Comey refuses to criticize the broad ongoing collection of the phone records of Americans and defends the indefinite detention of U.S. citizens deemed to be enemy combatants. He also explains why he signed off on a memo authorizing waterboarding while serving under Attorney General John Ashcroft. We'll speak with a former FBI agent, Colleen Rowley, then Bradley Manning on trial. The former chief prosecutor at Guantanamo, Colonel Morris Davis, testifies for the defense, saying the files Manning leaked on Guantanamo had no value to enemy groups and could not have harmed U.S. national security. Colonel Davis joins us today. But first, as the political crisis escalates in Egypt, we'll go to Cairo for a report from Sharifa Bokadus. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Spain's acknowledged a request from the U.S. prompted last week's blockade of a plane carrying Bolivian President Evo Morales. The Bolivian plane was grounded in Austria for 14 hours after Spain, France, Portugal and Italy closed their airspace over false rumors NSA leaker Edward Snowden was on board. On Tuesday, Spanish Foreign Minister José Manuel García Margala confirmed for the first time the rumor came from the U.S. government. He went on to say he's willing to apologize to Bolivia. There seems to be a misunderstanding there. And if there is a misunderstanding, I don't have any problem apologizing to President Morales. That is, if President Morales thinks that there has been a misunderstanding, that is no problem. I insist, neither the airspace nor landing authorization were closed at any moment. It's the only one that remains open. On Tuesday, Evo Morales criticized European countries for acceding to U.S. demands, saying the former colonizers of Latin America are now being colonies of the United States. The invaders, the colonists, now they are the colonies, and they are the invaded, and they are the ones to submit to the United States. I don't understand what is happening in Europe. From here, I believe that, along with the social movements of Europe, we are going to defend the sovereignty and dignity of these people who are also our peers. On Tuesday, a Russian lawmaker fueled rumors surrounding Snowden's next steps after posting a Twitter message saying he's accepted Venezuela's asylum offer. The tweet was deleted shortly after. On its Twitter feed, the group WikiLeaks said Snowden has not yet accepted asylum in Venezuela and that an announcement will be made, quote, if and when the appropriate time comes, unquote. In an interview shortly after conducting an online chat with Snowden, the journalist who brought his disclosures to the world, Glenn Greenwald, said he thinks Venezuela is Snowden's best bet. There are news reports today that he's formally accepted the asylum offer from Venezuela. Whether those news reports are accurate or not, um, I, I don't want to comment on. But I think, personally, just speaking for myself, that of the three options, that one seems like the most plausible. Figuring out how to get to the country that has offered him asylum without the rogue lawless empire that has proven itself willing to engage in a rogue behavior to prevent him physically from getting there, um, being able to stop him, that's the challenge. Glenn Greenwald was speaking from Brazil, where he's published his latest report showing NSA spying has extended to all of Latin America. The surveillance has gone far beyond issues of terrorism claimed by the U.S. government, with areas of focus including Venezuela's oil industry and Mexico's energy sector. Brazil says it's set up a task force to investigate the allegations and is still waiting on U.S. diplomats to provide a formal explanation. The standoff between Egypt's interim government and the Muslim Brotherhood Party it replaced in power continues to widen. Egypt's top prosecutor has ordered the arrest of Muslim Brotherhood leader Mohamed Badi and other top officials on charges of inciting violence. The Muslim Brotherhood's accused of sparking the violence that ended in the army's fatal shootings of at least 51 supporters of ousted President Mohamed Morsi and the wounding of hundreds more. The charges come one day after the Muslim Brotherhood rejected a role in Egypt's interim cabinet. 
On Tuesday, Egypt's interim president also named former finance minister Hazem El Bablawi as interim prime minister and Nobel Peace laureate Mohamed Abardai as vice president. We'll have more from Egypt with Democracy Now! correspondent Sharif Abdelkadus after headlines. Russia is backing Syrian government claims that an alleged chemical attack earlier this year came from rebels fighting Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Presenting evidence to the United Nations, Russian Ambassador Vitaly Cherkin cited the findings of a team of Russian experts on the ground. The results of the analysis clearly indicate that the ordnance used in Kanal Asal was not industrially manufactured and was filled with sarin. The sarin technical specifications prove that it was not industrially manufactured either. The absence of uh, chemical stabilizers in the samples of the detected toxic agents indicate the relatively recent production. The projectile involved is not a standard one for chemical use. Hexogen, utilized as an opening charge, is not used in standard ammunitions. Therefore, there is every reason to believe that it was the armed opposition fighters who used the chemical weapons in Khan al-Assal. The Russian team was allowed in after the Syrian government blocked a U.N. investigation. Syrian rebels have blamed the government for the March attack near Aleppo, which left at least 26 people dead. The White House rejects uh, what uh, Russia's claims. Confirmation hearings have begun for James Comey, the former Bush administration official tapped by President Obama to head the FBI. On Tuesday, Comey told the Senate Judiciary Committee he now sees waterboarding as a form of torture, a shift from his stance in 2005, when he authorized a Bush administration legal memo justifying its use. Comey said he signed off on waterboarding at the time after fighting against it and knowing he would soon be stepping down. Comey also gave his backing to President Obama's surveillance program, saying he believes it's under sufficient oversight. Comey is well known for refusing to reauthorize the Bush administration's warrantless spy program while serving as acting attorney general, forcing the Bush administration to make changes. We'll have more on James Comey's confirmation hearings later in the broadcast. A group of same-sex couples has filed suit challenging Pennsylvania's same-sex marriage ban. It's the first case seeking to overturn a gay marriage ban on the state level since last month's Supreme Court decision rejecting the Federal Defense of Marriage Act and allowing same-sex marriages to resume in California. Attorney Mark Aronchik and plaintiff Julia Lubour spoke out from the Pennsylvania Capitol in Harrisburg. There is a public sentiment here in Pennsylvania that is rolling ever forward toward uh, freedom to marry. It's a tragedy that, that talented, loving, productive citizens have to leave this state if they want our marriages recognized. The American Civil Liberties Union says it plans to file similar cases challenging same-sex marriage bans in Virginia and North Carolina. The Texas House has given provisional approval to the controversial bill that would shut down nearly all the state's abortion clinics and ban abortion at 20 weeks post-fertilization. Republicans are seeking to push the measure through after last month's filibuster by Texas State Senator Wendy Davis and a crowd of supporters. The Texas House will hold a final vote today before sending the bill to the Senate. A federal investigation of the Miami Police Department has uncovered a pattern of excessive force and delays in the investigation of police shootings. The probe was launched in 2011 after a spate of killings by Miami officers of young African-American men, seven killed over the course of eight months. In recent years, Miami has seen one fatal shooting per every 220 police officers, compared to one for every 4,300 officers in New York City. In total, the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division found officers fired at people intentionally 33 times from 2008 to 2011. In a statement, the ACLU of Florida said the findings should lead to prosecution, saying, quote, people's rights have been violated and lives have been unjustly taken. Now that the groundwork has been laid, we expect a follow-up investigation into the conduct of Miami Police Department officers who were responsible, they said. Supporters of the jailed civil rights attorney Lynn Stewart rallied outside a federal court in Manhattan Tuesday to oppose the denial of her compassionate release. A 73-year-old grandmother, Lynn Stewart, is fighting stage 4 cancer that's metastasized, spreading to her lymph nodes, shoulder, bones and lungs. 
Lynn Stewart is serving a 10-year sentence in a federal prison near Fort Worth, Texas. In 2005, she was found guilty of distributing press releases on behalf of her jailed client, Egyptian cleric Omar Abdurrahman, also known as the Blind Sheikh. The Federal Bureau of Prisons rejected attorney Lynn Stewart's transfer to a hospital last month, despite the recommendations of her prison warden. Stewart's husband, Ralph Pointer, said her condition is getting worse by the day. Lynn is getting sicker by the day, and when I went to see her the 4th of July, I was afraid I wouldn't get a chance to visit her because she's in quarantine. What's quarantine mean? That means her white blood cell count is so low that it is dangerous for her to be in population. So they didn't stop her from visiting me, but she's still not in population. They said she is self-sufficient. She doesn't do anything for herself. She doesn't go to get her meals. She doesn't clean. She doesn't make up her bed. And they say, oh, she's self-sufficient. And yet in the prison, she does nothing. Ralph Pointer, the husband of jailed civil rights attorney Lynn Stewart. To see more of a discussion on her case, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Narmeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.